Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. تبارك الذي جعل في السماء بروجا وجعل فيها سراجا وقمرا منيرا وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفة لمن أراد أن يذكر أو أراد شكورا وعباد الرحمن وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض حونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما والذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما والذين يقولون ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساءت مستقرا موقاما والذين إذا والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر إلها آخر ولا يقتلون النفس الذي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون ومن يفعل ذلك يلقى أثاما يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل, وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك فأولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنا وكان الله غفور رحيما ومن تاب وعمل صالحا فإنه يتوب إلى الله متابا Blessed is the one who has placed constellations in the sky as well as a radiant lamp and a luminous moon and he is the one who causes the day and the night to alternate as a sign for whoever desires to be mindful or to be grateful. The true servants of the most compassionate are those who walk on the earth humbly. And when the foolish address them improperly, they only respond with peace. They are those who spend a good portion of the night prostrating themselves and standing before their Lord. They are those who pray, Our Lord! Keep the punishment of hell away from us, for its punishment is indeed unrelenting. It is certainly an evil place to settle and reside. They are those who spend neither wastefully nor stingily, but moderately in between. They are those who do not invoke any other god besides Allah, nor take a human life made sacred by Allah, except with legal right, nor commit fornication. And whoever does any of this will face the penalty. Their punishment will be multiplied on the Day of Judgment, and they will remain in it forever in disgrace. As for those who repent, believe, and do good deeds, they are the one whose evil deeds Allah will change into good deeds. For Allah is all-forgiving, most merciful. 
and whoever repents and does good has truly turned to Allah properly. Jazakumullah khair. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Jazakumullah Hasib. So to begin this event, I'll be reciting or telling you guys what the MSA purpose is. So the MSA, the Rutgers MSA's purpose is to provide all members of the Rutgers community with an understanding of Islam according to the Quran and the practices of the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu The Rutgers MSA is committed to the unity of all Muslims standing under the banner of there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his final messenger. Um, and to introduce our speaker, Mohammed Shalan. Mohammed Shalan is a graduate of Rutgers University with a BS in marketing and an MBA from NJIT. He works at Google as a consumer research manager. Mohammed served as uh, the YM coordinator for three years in New Jersey and two years in Houston, and currently serves as a mentor for YM New Jersey. He, he received Islamic education through Al Maghrib Institute and is attending local classes with Dr. Hatem Al Hajj and is currently a third year student at Mis Misca University uh, and he's working towards a BS in Islamic sciences. Muhammad serves the New Jersey community by giving khutbahs, lectures, and classes in many universities and masajid. He resides in Somerset, New Jersey, New Jersey with his wife and three kids. Without further ado. To begin, I wanted to thank all of you guys for having me, uh, mainly Brother Ice for the invitation, and for all the brothers and sisters who helped put this together. Uh, SubhanAllah, I see a lot of familiar faces. Who came to honor with us? It's really awesome to see some familiar uh, brothers and sisters too. So, what was the topic? What's the topic for today? Huh? <laughs> All right, what's, what's, the, what's the title of the event today? Huh? Okay, so the, for those that saw the flyer, it says thoughts before you tie the knot, something like that. Okay? I wanted you guys to really focus on the idea of thoughts. Right? I'm not here to teach you cup of marriage. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, a lot of these thoughts are thoughts that you have. You thought about. How many seniors? Okay, inshallah. So you're thinking about marriage. Okay. Some of you guys have a job, or maybe you're gonna think about having a job, so you're thinking about marriage. If you're younger than a senior, don't think it, just don't worry. <laughs> the time will come, right? I promise. Um, also, by show of hands, how many of you guys attended a lecture or a talk or a class about marriage before? Keep your hands up, Ash. I want to see. Keep your hands up. It's okay. There's no shame in that. You should. Keep your hands up. Okay. More brothers and sisters. That's great. Right? <laughs> Says a lot about the community. It's awesome. So, one of the things I wanted to talk about, we'll try to keep this interactive because, again, it is thoughts, right? Um, we do have a lot in our religion that talks about marriage, which is probably something that you get more, you should get more qualified person to talk about it. The thoughts today is we're going to have a discussion together. That's just going to be the nature of the event, inshallah. Who can, just to start, who can tell me some of the challenges that Muslims face today when they're trying to find a spouse? We'll start with the sisters, and then we'll go to the brothers, and then we'll go back and forth. Sisters. What are some of the challenges that come to your mind when you talk about finding a spouse? Yeah, let me start that. Who wants to start? Raise your hand or answer. So, so did you guys hear the question? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, so you can think. I can give you something. Okay, we'll come back to the challenges. Brothers, who can tell me some of the challenges that brothers face when it comes to finding a spouse? And I'll whisper that. 
Yes. Uh, parents. Oh, parents. What about parents? Uh, approaching parents on proposals, basically. Oh, approaching their own parents. Approaching your own parents, approaching the other person's parents. Okay, okay, that's awesome. How many of you guys think that's a challenge? Like going to your dad or mom, it's like, Mama, I'm going to get married. Just like, get down out of here. <laughs> okay, but also the opposite, like if you, find, if you find the right person, but approaching her parents, very good, okay. What else? Sisters. So parents, talk to your own parents or the other, uh, the other person's parents. What else? Sisters, yeah, but I know I, there's a lot of them, by the way, we'll talk about them, inshallah. But I want to I wanna get you guys talking, so I frame my talk. What are the challenges? I'll get to the brothers. Yes? Finding someone that will like, bring you closer to Islam. Ah, mashallah. Finding somebody who will get you closer to Islam. Very good. I love that. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Yes? I guess uh, trying, to, trying your best to find the real nature of someone in your without a uh, mm -hmm. constant advantage. Mm -hmm. I love that. Finding the real nature of somebody without crossing the boundaries. Very good. I'll tell you guys a story, a true story. There's a brother um, who had a relationship with his sister for five years in college. Five years. Uh, it's a questionable, right? But again, they were married. They just knew each other. They were planning for marriage. Okay, they got married after they both graduated. They were the same year. They both graduated. Got divorced in three weeks. I met the brother after, and they went through like a, a huge, huge divorce. And one of the things he told me, right? And hopefully it doesn't scare any of you guys away from marriage. But he said that Islam should allow for us to live together before getting married. We'll talk about how to find the nature of somebody at, it, at some point in Shalom, but this is a really good point. I heard this with my own eyes from a brother who is practicing, right? So it's a great point. Sisters, what else? What other challenges are out there when it comes to finding a spouse? Yes? That's a good one. There's actually two things. You said within your age, and then when who's mature. Let me ask the group a question. I'll ask the brothers, and then I'll come back to the sister. I want you guys to think about this. What do you guys think is important? Or is more important? Maturity or age? Maturity. Maturity. All consensus. So you would marry, for the brothers, you would marry a sister who's older than you and mature, that someone who's younger than me and immature. Who said yes? Raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's okay, guys, by the way, there are thoughts. I need you to think about these things. Because a lot of times, I'll tell you, the biggest problem, this is, if anybody's taking notes, this is the biggest problem that brothers and sisters face when they're about to find a spouse. They have no idea what they want. No idea. You get asked that question, I can maturity, huh? And then you realize, wait a minute. What if she's, one of her sisters like five years older than me, just mature, but like I'm 22, she's 27. Uh, okay, I'll take somebody who's a little less mature. And then, and then you start realizing that there are trade-offs. Okay, so it's okay that you're having these thoughts and you get questions and you're like, uh, let's think about it, okay? What about the sisters? What do you think is more important now when I said that? What's more important, maturity or age? Maturity. You still think maturity? All right, awesome. Okay, brothers, we'll take one more person, inshallah, from each and then we'll move on. Challenges, what are some of the challenges that brothers face when they're thinking about marriage? Yes? Like marrying outside of the culture. Oh, marrying outside of your culture, right? If you're Arab, you're trying to marry Arab. If you're Desi, you're trying to marry Desi. Okay, very good, that's a really good one. And I know, by the way, many of us, don't like it to be this way. It's like, oh, I wish my parents can be a little bit more open, right? And the reality is, 
when they are not, a lot of times they have their own reasons. Okay? Okay, just by show of hands, how many of you guys are born in America? Okay. How many of you guys' parents were born in America? Your parents created a cultured home. Like if you're from Arab, your house is just an Arab household. Or like a Desi household. Yeah. What a lot of us don't realize is that yes, I am born in America. I'm okay to marry outside of my culture. But when you start doing that, when you start meeting somebody from outside your culture, you realize, wait, I have no idea that this culture is so different from me. So while you are all Americans, because you're born and raised here, your upbringing, what you're used to, your household, the tone, the vibe of your home is very Arab or very Desi or very Sudanese or whatever you came from. And that's something that you should not take lightly. Because when you go into your own spouse and you try to create a vibe for your own house, you find a lot of confidence. Okay, so very good. Sisters, last sister, inshallah, they will move on. What are some of the challenges that you face when you're trying to find a spouse? The brother just told me that the Q&A form was sent in the chat. So, do you have any specific questions? Uh, very good. Trying to get to know somebody in a way. Very good. Okay. Here is how I structure this, guys. So we're all aligned with what we're going to be talking about in the next 30 minutes or so. Then we'll try to wrap up, and I'm happy to answer any questions. First, I'm going to go through three modules together, like three parts. The first is why you want to get married in the first place. This is very important. Understanding the objective of marriage. Okay? That's the first thing we'll talk about. Second, we're going to talk about the type of relationships that you can build. And you can choose which relationship, which type of relationships you want to build. And based on that, we're going to talk about who you are as a person and what you want. And how to kind of figure that out. If we have time, we make it a little bit into the process of from you see somebody in the hallway and she was like, man, she's cute. <laughs> and then to get married to that person if she doesn't think you're a creep. We'll talk about that process in Sarla. To start, why do people want to get married in the first place? Why do people want to get married in the first place? What's the, what's the objective? Why married, man? What's wrong with single life? I can go wherever I want, whenever I want. Instead of having a husband waking up in the morning and he's smelling and he wants you to make food for him. I'm being serious. I've been married for six years. Yeah, let me see that. Sisters, why do people want to get married? Yes, in the back. Huh? To complete half of their deed? Okay. <laughs> We're destroying everything. Let's take one brother, then we'll come back to sister. Yes. It's in everybody's innate nature to want to have like an intimate companion. Absolutely, intimacy. This, this is something we actually don't talk a lot about. You know the hadith of the Prophet What is the hadith of the Prophet He said to the youth, to the guys, whoever is have the means to get married then let them get married. And then he said, because it does two things. Who remembers? The very famous hadith, you should all know it. Because getting married does two things for you. Huh? Yeah. Does it prevent zina? You're very close. It protects, yeah, it protects you from zina. That's, that's, and it, lower, it helps you lower your gaze. This is all about interest. As if the Prophet basically is saying, get married, 
So we shouldn't be shy away from that. The brother who mentioned it, Jazakallah khair. That's one of the objectives. In a halal yad. Systems. Support, like emotional support? Emotional support. Very good. Have companions. Very good. Brothers. Yes. To raise a bloodline of grandchildren. So to have Muslim children and then continue to increase the Muslim community. Very good. Brothers in the back. One of the brothers in the back had their hands up. Yeah, you right there. Go ahead. <laughs> to have kids. To have kids. Okay. Another mess. Very good. Uh, so there's actually there's a couple of things, guys, that we see. We learn this from the we learn this from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and I want each one of you guys to think about why to get married in the first place. Because understanding why will help you a lot decide who to marry to, when to marry, how to marry. Of the very, very top priorities, this is like the number one objective of marriage, is to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to seek more reward. We have a plethora of a hadith that talks about the reward of husband and wife interacting with each other. Of them, for example, the Prophet tells the men that you can give sadaqah in so many sources. And he mentions for to somebody to poor, he said, like a lot of sources of to give charity. And he says, and you should give charity and spend on your family. And the best money you spend is that off or is that on your own family? Your wife and your kids. That's a reward. Another thing, the Prophet he says that when you feed your own wife, you feed her. Whether you buy her the food, okay, or you help her cook, or you actually feed her physically with your own hands, there is reward in that. It's considered sadaqah. The Prophet Sallallahu tells both of the men and women is that when you're intimate with each other in a halal manner, it counts as a reward. And even the companions were like, how? 
How, how is it that we're fulfilling our own desires? How is that elevating that act to be rewarded by God? These thoughts in their mind that Allah is just is above all of this. But the Prophet made it a point to teach them, no, Allah is going to reward you because otherwise you're going in the haram. That when you are intimate with one another, you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you care about what she wants and you care about what he wants. The Prophet sallallahu in another hadith, he said that when a woman pleases her husband, he, said, he says this, I, I, I don't want you to do this trip with the girls. I don't want you to do this. I would love if you do that. In a nice manner. And she says, okay, whatever you want, I'll do it for you. It's not because he's controlling. It may very well be, but it's not because of that. You're not going to do it because he's controlling. You're going to do it because it's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the biggest objectives at the highest level of marriage is to seek reward. Is to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is your path to paradise. So it's not all everything that you guys mentioned is important. The company and the kids and all that. But at the highest level, is that I'm getting married to seek reward. Because I don't want to do something haram. And staying away from the haram by doing something halal is rewardable. So, at the highest level, you gain a reward. Very close, second, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the very famous verse about marriage. He said, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So you can be peace and tranquility for each other. This is the vibe of the home. And we talk about culture, we make jokes and all that. But the vibe of the home is that you want to go home. It's home. You want to find comfort. And that happens through both of you. You understand that, listen, the objective is that we create a peaceful household. A serene, tranquil, peaceful household. That's the objective. So whatever it takes. Yeah, maybe you need to get rid of your video games a little bit. So you can get to that point. Yes, maybe you need to get rid of your target shopping a little bit. Okay? To create a peaceful home. I'm being very stereotypical by the way. Right? But that's on purpose. Is that whatever it takes, the objective is to create that tranquil home. Another thing, very close, as like a third or a fourth, is to be intimate. Because the Prophet clearly mentions these things. So a lot, of, a lot of times, there is a lot of stigma around that. For both brothers and sisters. Get to a point where you're comfortable with that, because it's part of what it is. It's, it's part of that marriage. You, you, you just, you're going to have to enjoy that. You're going to have to train yourself to, to work together towards that. And it's not going to happen overnight. You're going to have to be... The why is very important, guys. The highest level reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, creating a home with comfort and peace and tranquility, uh, to have intimacy and company. Uh, part of it, and I know this is going to sound really obvious, part of the objective is to lead single life. It's not to be single anymore. And a lot of us are like, oh, being single is really awesome. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Right? I mean, all these guys that are around you and hanging out, yeah, because you're in college, you graduate, everybody does the whole thing. People move to different states, right? People move on with their life. Now, I'm not saying that if you're single, you're going to be miserable. No, you can be very happy as a single guy, but don't be your objective, right? To have company, right? Just somebody to fight with, man. I'm being serious. And it's all part of that marriage. It's all part of the experience, right? Um, and also it helps us realize that there are certain things we're not going to be able to do when we're married versus when we're single. Because you're leaving that single life, you're transitioning from one next. The other thing, as I think some of you guys mentioned, is to grow and develop emotionally. You will learn so much by yourself once you get married. You're like, man, I didn't know I'm like that. And that's part of your growth. One of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people do when they're about to get married, they were like, well, this is the way I am. You like it or you don't. 
It's the dumbest thing anybody can say. Why, why can't you change? Why can't you grow? Why can't you develop? If there's somebody who's very sincerely trying to build a relationship with you, and he says, you get mad really quickly. You may not have realized that, or maybe your mom might be telling this or something like it. You just didn't realize it. Work on it. Instead of just being like, oh, it's just the way it is. You like it or you don't. No. Work on it. Develop. Improve. Be better. Right? You're going to be better spiritually. You're going to be better you know, intellectually. You're going to be better mentally, emotionally. You learn things of how to interact. I'll tell you guys something. We are very different. Guys, we are very different from girls. Like, up here is very different. <laughs> You're going to have to learn that. Right? And that's part of your growth. It's part of your development. Right? Don't expect that the moment you are married, or you, you get into a relationship, you're going to be the same. You're not. Right? Your emotional intelligence should increase. Because it must increase, but it should. You should work on that. And the same thing with the sisters. Right? Brothers are very different. They have a very different way of thinking. You're going to have to learn that. And accommodate. And learn, and develop, and improve. It's part of the experience. Part of marriage is to grow together. It's to develop together. It's to learn about each other. That's why the Prophet said that we always get these kind of not necessarily complaints, but consultations. Companions will come and ask certain questions. Can you help with this? Can you help with that? And the Prophet will always cater depending on the people who are asking. Right? And we have so many of that in the, in, in the Sira Lani. But understand why you want to get married. Now, all of these reasons is not going to fit for each one of you. To some of you, some of these reasons might have some more weight than others. That's okay. Maybe you're a person who wants just to have one or two kids. So the weight is maybe not. Maybe for others who like, oh, my, I want have seven kids, man. I want to have a football team running around. I don't know, five kids, by the way. I have three, I'm very bad. We're probably nuts. And my wife too, right? Like no joke. Personally, when I when I when I got married, I told my wife I wanted seven kids. She was like, "It's like I come from one wife." Right? I'm like, well, I mean, good time, So anyway, um, but part of the experience is that you kind of adjust as you go, right? One two kids, and you realize, man, this is a handful. This is too much. We're good. And that's all part of it. For some of us, intimacy is very important, right? And, and it should be, to fear if, if this is something that you really care about. So the point is, a lot of these reasons may have different weights for each one of you individually, so think about them. Sit with yourself when it's time, at least the seniors, and those in Shabbat that are really thinking about getting married. Think about these, which of these do I really want? Right? How do I work towards that? You know. And you know, we'll get to talk, talk about it in a second, but like when someone is seeking reward, it's like, man, do I have my deen in check? Because if you don't pray, right, if you don't fast, if you don't do the basics, and you're like, oh, I'm just gonna feed her strawberries in her mouth, and I'm gonna go to Jannah. No, you won't. <laughs> you have bigger things to worry about. Get your five daily prayers on, you know, on time, do that, right? Same thing for the sisters. Make sure you focus on the most important thing. Because once we make seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the objective, you realize, well, I have a long way to go. I still have to work about the basics of my deen before I add more responsibilities. Right? And so on and so forth. So thinking about why is very, very important. And it's a very personalized, individualized thinking process. Don't meet with your friends and kind of talk. No, think about it by yourself. And try to figure it out on your own. Now, there are three types of relationships. Okay. This is one of the most important parts that we're going to be talking about today, inshallah. And if anybody's taking notes, I think you should take notes. Three types of relationships. Okay. Then these types also could exist with friends and just spouses. But it's a lot more common and a lot more visible among spouses. First, is a codependent relationship. A codependent relationship. Basically, you got into this relationship with so much reliance on the other person that their absence 
breaks your heart. That you cannot function without them. And this can happen among brothers and among sisters. Is that you build up that I am incomplete without my spouse. So let me find a spouse that completes me. You get into this relationship and you are so codependent on the other person that you almost suffocate them without realizing. Because to you, you would like, man, I'm gonna fall apart if he goes and hangs out with his family or with his friends. Oh, if she's not around, man, I don't know what I'm gonna do. To me, I'm gonna do something else, <laughs> right? But it's a codependent relationship. And this is something you're going to have to figure out on your own. Okay? Now, while this relationships, these type, this type of relationship is very common, it's one of the worst. Right? Because you get into this habit of solely relying on each other. That you leave everything else. Right? And again, sometimes it's from one side to the other, and sometimes it's both of them. So ask yourself, am I whole without my spouse? Am I whole? Like, am I, like, can I be good on my own if she's not around or if he's not around? It's a big question to ask. And this may, just may, make you delay marriage a little bit, which will be beautiful for you. Do you realize that I have to work on myself? Right? Now, there's another extreme, which is independent relationships. You do your thing, I do my thing, we'll see each other on the They exist too, right? For example, and I'm not, I'm not hating, I'm not so really focused on their careers, I'm not, right? But there could be people who are so focused on their career that they literally don't have time for their stuff. They're very independent on their own, right? That the, the interaction is very rare, right? He's busy doing his own thing, she's busy doing her own thing. They have two parallel paths. They live together, they're married, okay? But they're doing their own thing. And then periodically, they'll hang out. And a lot of times, every time they hang out, they see that they're actually driving two different lives. It's also very dangerous. The third, and perhaps the most harmonious of them all, is the interdependent. Interdependent relationships. Those are two individuals who are whole on their own. They're good on their own, but they choose to be together. They choose to experience things together. One of the examples, and you know, I didn't have time to think about a more appropriate example, but I'm just going to use that example for, you know, for the sake of driving this message home. Think about two dancers, right? They're all good on their own. Like two, two professional dancers that can operate on their own, right? They can have their own shows, but they chose to dance together. Same thing for you. And this is one of the goals to try to get to. It's first you become whole, and then you find a person that is willing to experience things with you, willing to do things with you. But if they're busy, you still be fine. Right? Because there will be time in your life where you're going to be busy, or she's going to be busy, or he's going to be busy. Right? You'll be fine. You're not going to be sitting home crying because she's home late. Okay? You're not going to be sitting home because he's traveling for work for a week, and you're like, I don't know what to do without you. You are interdependent. You are both are great on your own, very professional, you know, well-developed individuals, but you choose to do things together, let's travel together, let's go and see your family, let's come see my family. You, you build this bond together, right? And this is one of the most successful relationships, and it will take a little bit of work to get there, but the very beginning, that's why, if any of you guys, which I highly recommend, and it's something that's been, been pushed lately, is whenever you get into premarital counseling, that is almost the first thing that they go through, is are you whole on your own? Are you good on your own? Because if you think 
that you are incomplete. Unless you get married, you will still feel incomplete after you get married. Because you're going to have this massive expectation, like, oh, she's going to do this to me, he's going to do this for me, blah, blah, blah. Like, you should be whole, I hope that makes sense. So now, we covered why we get married. Think about these objectives, these reasons. Number two is that what relationship you want to build. Right? And obviously, once you figure out the why, you'll be able to know the type of relationship I mentioned, the three types, so you guys think about that. The next is, who are you? Not being serious, who are you? Ready? I'm going to pick on a bank for a second. Until you go. Right? Like, if you, if you were to stand here right now, tell me, I just want to say. It's a very difficult question to answer. Very difficult. But you gotta figure out who you are. What do you like? What's your vibe? On your own, not with your friends, not in college, on your own. Who you are? Who are you? What are, what are the things that you care about? Right? What are the things that drive you? What makes you wake up in the morning? What challenges are you faced in life? What struggles do you have? What are the things that you're struggling with? Like, who you are. You've got you to be able to figure out who you are. That is one of the most important things to know. And it will take some time. But this is, this is a perfect time, by the way, in college, to figure out. Because to some extent, you're still developing, but you already have a lot to work with when it comes to your personality. Now, all the things, for example, that you can think about is, some of those are easier than others, but are you an extrovert or an introvert? Okay. Do you like outdoor or indoor? Right. Do you have a good relationship with your, with your mom or not? With your dad or not? Do you, are you career driven? Or you just want to get a job, get paid, and move on with life? Are you active? Like physically active? So these, again, these, a lot of these are easy. Okay? What are your challenges? What sins do you struggle with? Right? What sins do you struggle with? Again, that goes for both brothers and sisters. What kind of personality traits do you want to develop? Or do you want to work on? This is who you are. Right? What level of religiosity are you in? There's actually a Yaqeen, there's a Yaqeen Institute test. You answer a bunch of questions, it takes about 10 minutes. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can actually, I think it's called the Yaqeen Institute Spirituality Test or something like that. You can check it out. Figure out your own personality, like spiritual personality. And they break it apart and they give you like your match from the companions, which is kind of cool. Right? You gotta figure out who you are. Are you the type of a guy who just prays five times a day, stays with the basics, and that's it? Or are you ambitious where you want to see more knowledge and you know be part of just the bigger things in, in the world or in your community? Who are you? This is one of the most important questions to answer. And I know I give you some examples, and you're like, oh, I can answer these. What kind of culture values do you really hold dear to your heart? How many of you guys, I want you to think about this, how many of you guys talk to your aunts or uncles back home? Yeah, a few of us don't. Yeah, a few of you guys, that's great. How many of you care about that versus how many of you are forced to do it? Because your mom's like, Dr. <laughs> Hamid. A lot of these values are going to determine the person you're looking for. So that's the first step. Figure out who you are. Right? And there's a, there's a lot more than that, by the way. I'm just giving you examples here. But think about who you really are. Right? What's, what's down there? This is stuff that nobody else needs to know. Just you. And hopefully your spouse when you're trying to get to each other. Right? Of the ways to find out, go ask your parents. They'll give you a little bit of hints. Things that you don't even realize. Wait, I'm like that? Yeah, because your mom and your dad know you more than better than anybody else. The second part of that, so first you figure out who you are. Second is that what do you want to your spouse? 
Because a lot of times, okay, let me ask you guys a question. I'll ask the brothers and the sisters. And you don't have to answer for yourself in particular. But if I were to tell you, tell me three things that guys look for when they want to find a spouse. Tell me three things. Who can tell me three things? Yes. Modesty. Modesty. What else? Yes, I'm on three. Top, top three. Modesty. Dean. Dean. Beauty. Beauty. Beautiful. Okay, sisters. So you said modesty, dean, beauty. Sisters. Real talk here, by the way. Right? So feel free to say anything about the brothers. Yes, who wants to go? Three things that are on the top. Here are the three things that every sister wants in a spouse. Yes. Um, dean, dean, money. money. What is that third? Looks. looks. Okay, very good. Dean, money, looks. Okay, back to the brothers. Tell me three things. Three top things. You can be as specific and as, as general as you want. Good. Um, actually, I have one, but loyalty. Loyalty. I love it. Anyone else? So loyalty. Give me two more. Yes. Huh? Intellect. Intellect. Yeah, you want somebody smart. Yes. Respect. Respect. Okay. Very good. Sisters. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, gentle. Gentle. Very good. Brothers. Tell me three things. Yes. Ambition. Ambition. Very good. You look that in your spouse. Very good. Yes. Family oriented, very good. Yes, in the back. Empathy. Humor. Humor? Yeah. Oh, I love that. I was expecting it at the very beginning. I'm glad you said, yes, brother, you, uh, the brother with the back, with the black jacket, you got something. Uh, empathy? Empathy, very good. Sisters, back to you. Yes, in the back. Self respect. Self respect, very good. Yes. Supportive. Supportive, very good. Yes. Humble. Humble, yes. Yeah, gentle. Kindness. Kindness, very good. Okay. This is a really interesting exercise because you realize that there are some differences, but there's also a lot of common. Okay? Meaning, it looks like respect came up multiple times. Obviously, religion came up multiple times. Now, when you figure out who you are as a person, so, you would realize that each of these drivers present a different definition in your mind. So, for example, you might say, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty religious guy. You may say that about yourself, like, oh, I'm religious. And because I'm religious, here's, here's the evidence. I pray five times a day, I wake up for Fajr, I know some Quran, I come to the MSA, I stay away from the heart. This is your definition of religious. Now, to somebody else, this is like, man, it's not religious, it's just Sufi Muslim. It's like the bare minimum. Religious is actually a little bit above that. Right? I'm active in the community, I try to learn, like, above that. So now, two brothers are religious, but religiosity is defined very different from one to the other. Does this make sense, guys? Right? Now, the sisters, you mentioned respect. Now, this respect manifests itself in a different way. It could be respecting your opinion. That's huge for many of the sisters at the very top. Like, ask for an opinion. Don't, don't act like I don't exist. You make certain decisions about your life. Don't ask me. Now, when you figure out, like, I'm a respectful person because... I give people the right to speak. I ask people around me for their opinion. I respect your choices. This is, this is you being respectful. So now you know that respect that you're looking for in a, in a guy is defined this way. Because this is, the, because this is how you manifest respect in your life. Does this make sense, guys? So defining who you are and what you want is it just that, oh, I want somebody religious? Well, that could mean a hundred different things. What does that really mean? And it has to match you. It has to match what you do. 
Because otherwise, you're not going to be compatible. Your own religiosity is going to be one, two, three. That's what you look for in a spouse. Your respect is going to be one, two, three. Because if you are planning for a respectful guy, you have to be willing to show him the respect that you expect from him. If you want a modest sister, right, you're going to have to show that modesty to her too. At your home when dealing. There's modesty. It's not just the way you dress. There's a beautiful, again, a clean paper that Shaykh Muhammad Shalom did about modesty or haya. To be more than just modesty. Modesty is not just the way you dress. It's the way you talk. It's the way you address elders. It's the way you address your mom. It's the way to address her mom. Right? It's the way to enter into a house. It's a way to eat. Modesty is much bigger than that. So you're going to have to identify your own modesty. What does modesty mean for you? How does modesty manifest itself in your life? As a guy, as a man. And now let me try to match that. Let me try to find a sister who matches that definition. And it's not always going to be like a perfect matching. But once you know who you are as a person, and what all of these elements mean for you, you'll be able to find the other person. And so on and so forth. You guys hopefully get the framework here and keep thinking about it. Money, it comes up a lot. I want somebody with money. Right? Actually, I'm going to use looks, because it was mentioned on both sides. To be beautiful, and when a sister said looks. What does that mean? Right? A lot of girls want a guy who's taller than them. Right? A lot of sisters want a guy who's built. No bellies. That's for later. You have kids, then you have bellies. Right? And even then it might not be acceptable. Right? For for you know, subhanAllah, I'm gonna share a true story with you guys. And um, and again, like I feel like a lot of the stories that I mentioned <laughs> might discourage you. It's not. It's just it's just a little bit of a reality check. And so hopefully, it's not discouraging you guys, uh, but just food for thought. There's a brother that, obviously when he got, you know, when he met a sister, uh, she was hijabi, so he didn't see her hair. Okay, and, you know, fell in love, amazing two people, she's amazing, he's amazing, everything's great. And um, when he saw her hair, he was very turned off. Right? Very turned off. Right? But you know what? It's not a big deal. That's what he said in his mind. It's not a big deal. So he married. He got married. Okay? And for several months in the beginning, Alhamdulillah, they still married. Hello, bless them. Sandy. Um, uh, he was really struggling with that. He was really struggling with that. To the point, that he would ask her to put her hijab on during intimacy. Right? Now, here's the thing. You gotta have to realize, one of the things I told you guys is, weight each of these aspects that you care about. Meaning, if being religious in a certain manner carries the same weight as somebody who knows how to cook, then something, what the hell is wrong with you? Like it's not, it shouldn't have the same weight. Like if she, if she doesn't know how to cook, it's not a big deal. But if she doesn't pray, it's a huge deal. So not all factors are created equal. They're not all the same weight. So off the things, off the exercise that you run, and feel free to use pen and paper, is to basically weight the different things that you want. Looks for some people might be very heavy, like very meaty. It's, it's important. It's important. Right? Now, you put everything in like a list. You're like, I want her religious, that's like 50% of my choice. I want her to look a certain way, that's 25%. I want her to be family oriented, that's 10%. I want her to have a career, that's 5%. And there's about 10% left, you like, I want her to be like, Adventures. So that's that's your criteria. It's obviously a lot longer than that. Now you're not going to get 100%. You're not going to find 100%. But 
but you may find somebody who fits the religion at like 45%, so that's good. So he fits my definition of religiosity within 45%. So 45% out of 50, that's an 8, you're good. And then looks, uh, not sure. She's like 5 out of 10. Okay. Now keeping in mind, again, keeping in mind, depending on how much beauty is weighted in your eyes, you may decide to move forward or not. It's not the same. And again, I want you guys to think about this. It's not the same. And when the Prophet said he said that a woman gets proposed to for four things. The first thing he said was what? Was beauty, actually. Of the most famous narrations, it's beauty. A woman gets married for her beauty. That's the first thing. Why, brothers? Because it's a big deal. This is the woman you're going to wake up every morning looking at. It's a better people looking. In your eyes. In your eyes. Right? She doesn't have to be whatever. Right? But in your eyes, like, alhamdulillah, she's pretty. Oh man, it's the kind of. Oh, I got you. Right? And the same thing for the, for the sisters who are like, oh, I want him to have money. And there's nothing wrong with that. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what gives you the qawana is money. Now money means a lot of things to a lot of sisters. SubhanAllah, there was a scenario, this is again, another, another true story. There was a brother that I know um, that was trying to know, trying to get to know another sister. And I know both of them. So I tried to connect them together. Now one thing I know about the sister, okay, is that she's very brand central, like, like this is going to be brand, like everything I wear is going to be brand, shoes, brand. A lot of brothers are like that too, by the way, right, they just like to wear certain brands. Now this brother, just a simple guy, right, like a Walmart t-shirt will do, and he's happy with it. That's it, it it's not, he's not broke, he just doesn't care. Now to him, he's like, I'm happy to, you know, buy you whatever you want, but don't, don't ask me to have to wear all these brands, I don't really care. As long as it fits good, it looks good, I don't care. It could be $5, it could be $50, it doesn't matter to me. That's who he is. It didn't work out for them because to her, it meant a lot. But I want my husband to be walking around a certain way. Now we can discuss here right or wrong, but I want you guys to realize is that a lot of times when people get into these relationships or getting to know one person, they have criteria, but they have no idea the weight of this criteria. And you should not be weighted the same. Now, there are some guidelines, right, that we know from our religion of what needs to carry more weight. Obviously, at the top is religion. Religion needs to carry the highest weight in your in your in in, 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 in your calculations. That this is the number one thing I do for. Because Sorry if this is going to bother some of you guys, but a lot of the other things could and most likely will change with time. Like beauty, for example. Should be pretty, top notch, 10 out of 10. First three months. <laughs> and then it's going to go down out again. One kid, two kids, she looks like a different person. Right? And so I love that's part of it. So you were like, man, what happened? I wanted somebody who looked a certain way, and I thought he's just going to stay like that forever. No. What's going to keep her very pretty in your eye, eyes, is her religion. It's the way she's treating you. Same thing for the sisters. You want good look, good looks, right? But that will change. What will make him respectful and you know and and, and just had something in your eyes, is his treatment to you. And that's why the Prophet put it the two priorities is religion and manners. Because manners will increase somebody's love for you. And again, looks are there, but don't make it a number one priority. You're setting yourself up for, up for failure. Make religion and, uh, and, and characters and manners and you try to define those based on who you are, and I really, I really talked about this. The other thing that is also important up there 
is uh, the family orientation. Because a big part of the objective of marriage is to create a family. Is he able to create a family? Does he care about having a family? That's, that's again up there. So that you can assess that from his treatment, interaction with his own family, or you know, her interaction with her own family, and so on and so forth. You can assess that. And then for the guys in particular, is obviously his financial capability. Is he able to spend on it? Because you are responsible for that. Allah puts that responsibility on you. He gave you some rights, but he puts that responsibility on you. You don't have to be a billionaire, right? But you have to have enough money to make somebody, to put somebody in a decent standard of living, based on like, the average around you. But it's also going to depend on what she's expecting. Right? So that is something, again, a lot of these things are important because our deed talks about them. And then everything else can come later. Right? Career guys, I really think career doesn't have to carry more than 5 to 10% weight in the grand scheme of things. It's important. But subhanAllah, there's a brother I met, very, very career oriented. He met a girl that everything checks. Religious check, pretty checks, family checks, everything checks. He was like, man, every time I talk to her about business and stuff, she says, not there. I'm like, well, who cares? I'm <laughs> not trying to find a business partner. What's your life? If you're, if you're going home after a long day at work and you talk with your wife about work, something's wrong. That's not her, that's not her job. You should be talking about something else. You should be doing other things. And so, I don't know, I never worked out for her. And subhanAllah, he's still not married. He's almost 33 now, 34 years old. But subhanAllah, it's the thing. He's very, he's very business oriented. And he just wants to have business idea conversations. I'm like, bro, go have that with your boyfriends. <laughs> oh, guy friends. With <laughs> <laughs> guy friends. Right? Have business conversations, open businesses. And go do that. But not with your spouse. That's not what she's for. The same thing, you find, you find sisters who are like, man, I want somebody to be interested in my makeup. We're not! <laughs> we're, we're, we're pretty careless. Right? Very, 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 right brothers? How many of you guys really care about makeup here? <laughs> the two people. <laughs> right? But this again, like, a lot of, a lot of these things, again, like, you're able, you're able to assess and just keep it, keep it in mind, inshallah. Okay, my time's up. Can I steal five minutes? I promise, five minutes and then I'll end the I wanted to talk about the process. The reason I want to talk about the process is from the time you start to know somebody to the time you marry them, you go through multiple stages. As soon as you understand the objective of each state, it helps you make a decision better. For example, the first is get to know them, right? No engagement yet, no get big tab, no nikah, nothing, just getting to know them. And sometimes if, if you know them in college or you were in the same class or neighborhood or an extended family, friend, whatever it may be, like, you get to know that person. In that stage, your objective is to know them objectively. This is, this is your objective now. I need to know them. I don't need to fall in love with them. I don't need to know whether I can marry them or not. All I need to know is whether this person is good enough for me to get engaged to. Because that's the next step. Later I'll decide whether I should marry him or not. That's not a decision. A lot of people meet somebody who's like, oh, I don't know if I should marry them because it's awkward. It's okay. You're not, you're not deciding to marry them at the moment. You're just trying to get to know them. So everything you ask them is going to be like an interview. Like, hey, yo, you pray? <laughs> right? You wake up for peasant? What's happening? Right? How, how are you with your mom? You ask them these questions. Hey, have you had, you have guy friends? This is, this is a conversation. You get to know them. You assess objectively. You're not trying to hurt her feeling. She's not trying to hurt your feeling. You just get to know them. Because based on these answers, and you have obviously the answer sincerely. Okay. And even if there are certain things that you're struggling with, you share that. So that's the number one. The next stage, or the next step is engagement. So you know enough to get engaged. Don't try to know everything. That's another mistake a lot of people fall into. 
And I'm turning away everything about this person to decide whether I can marry them or not. Don't decide that right now. You're just deciding, is this the right person to get engaged to or not? That's the first step. So you know enough, like, okay, I know enough about them. I know enough about their family. There's a general, I like how they look like, I like how they're dressing, and generally, I'm gonna get engaged to them. Again, you're not, during the engagement period, you're not allowed to do much. You can talk, okay, with the purpose of getting married. So don't get into intimate discussions, don't try to fall in love with each other. Engagement is not for that. This will come later. You have plenty of time to fall in love with each other. What you're trying to do at that point is try to get to know the stuff that you know about them at a deeper level. But okay, they're generally good with their mom. Let me try to get a little bit closer. To How's that relationship happening? Right? She's generally good with her salah, with her salah, with her hijab, with her friends. Let me find out a little bit more. Let me learn. Let me get a little bit deeper into learning about that person. That is the engagement period. Again, one of the biggest mistakes people do is they fall in love too early. Don't. Just hold yourself. I'll tell you guys something. My sheikh, when I was engaged, I was engaged with my wife for about a year. I did get with them for two years. He actually gave me some criteria, which I thought was the weirdest thing in the world. But now, eight years later, it makes sense. He told me, if you guys are talking to each other, don't talk past 12 a.m. Just 12 a.m. just cut. Okay, so I'm like, sorry. That's it. He said, don't talk to her while you're laying on bed. Why does this make any sense? He was like, don't. As soon as you start finding yourself getting a little bit too emotional in your conversations, stop it. Just say, hey, let's continue later. It was the most frustrating thing in the world for both of us. It was like, again, that's really good. You're going to just build emotions. You're a human being, okay? And you're trying to talk to somebody with the intention to marry them. So naturally, emotions will build. Keep it inside to express them. Because the more you express them, the emotions are going to overshadow your practicality, your logical sense in both brothers and sisters. Like a lot of people, for example, accuse the sisters to be too emotional. Well, you have a lot of logic up here. But a lot of times you let emotions overshadow the logic. And a lot of people say, brothers are logical. That's not true either. Brothers are filled with emotions. Right? Rightfully so. The, our Prophet was very emotional. Sallallahu Alaihi said that. But he never let, it, let the logic overshadow the emotions. So you give the engagement period, it's another extension of just logically getting to know the person objectively. And naturally, the emotions will build. But don't express them too openly. And then, if everything is comfortable, and you feel like, Alhamdulillah, we got to know each other enough, now let's do the Kambikta, or the Nika, or the Desi here. And this one you can get very emotional with each other. Right? And send hearts and all kinds of good things. Right? But give each its own right. Don't try to get to know everything. Try to get to know the most important things. And inshallah, after that you will get with them, and then obviously, Marriage, and even after marriage, there's a lot of stages that you go through. Maybe that's a discussion for another day. Jazakallah, you guys really appreciate everybody's interactions and engagement on this talk. And if somebody has any questions, I'm happy to address them. So, I'm going to ask you 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 to um, there's a form in both the brothers and sisters chats if you guys have any questions. Um, so the first question that we have today is, how do I have a difficult conversation with parents such as not wanting an arranged marriage or wanting to get married earlier or later or convincing them about someone? Okay, so there's three parts to this question. Arranged marriages. Early? Was it early? Is it like Or later, okay. So, what's wrong with arranged marriages? No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely asking. What's wrong with arranged marriages? Uh, I feel like maybe a distinction should be made between arranged and forced. 
mental provision, emotional provision, sexual provision, uh, you know, intellectual. You provide. You take care of her. You make her, you make her that we. Right? If you don't do that, if you don't do that, don't come and talk to me about your rights. But this is where it starts. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He talks about it, He says what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about you first because you have that responsibility. The Prophet ﷺ will be doing i'tikaf and one of his wives, Safiya radiallahu will come and take hey, I just want to hang out with you. Like he could say, I'm doing i'tikaf and we'll wait later. Wait until Ramadan is over. He's like, no, let's go. So he would stay in the masjid by the door of her house. He was like, what's up? Which one talking about? <laughs> I can imagine, I know, some Allah he said that. I can imagine he was just the sweetest guy ever. Was he busy? Oh, he's more busy than you. Did he have more than a lot in his mind? Absolutely. But he made time. And he was a married one. <laughs> but he made time. But he wanna hang out to school. He would go break it. Because why? Because he understood وسلم, that he has a responsibility towards his wives. You have a responsibility too. That, that starts with you. If you, I promise you brothers, Allah is your older brother, if you fulfill your responsibilities, there's a high likelihood that she will do whatever you want. The reason, the reason you might not, or you might see that she's not gonna, you know, she's not listening to you, she's not respecting that, because you haven't fulfilled your responsibilities. And this will take time for you to learn about her. But the part of it is like, what makes you happy now? For the sisters, again, without having to sugarcoat it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it an obligation for you to obey your husband. Now there are exceptions to that obedience, and that is the same exceptions that a parent, like a child, has on like if, if you are, you are not required to obey your parents or your spouse in these circumstances. Number one is that if they tell you to do something, that's haram. That's obvious, right? They tell you to take your hijab off, don't do it, right? They tell you not to pray, don't do it, like you know all that. So anything haram, you're not allowed to. Uh, obey them. Secondly, anything that's harmful to you or somebody else. Like for example, your husband comes and tells you, don't ever talk to your mom. Right? Now, unless, and that's again a very, very rare scenario, but unless there is a reason that actually he thinks that talking to your mom harms you, it is a different discussion. But if, if your mom is just a nice woman and he just has an issue with your mom, he tells you, that's harmful. That's harmful emotionally, that's harmful religiously. That's haram. Right? What do you mean? What are we talking about? Right? If he tells you something that is just stupid, <laughs> like go stand by the corner for an hour. Right? Or whatever, something something is dumb. Right? You don't have to listen to that. So something haram, you don't have to listen. Something harmful to you or others, you don't have to listen. Something that is uh, that's, that's, uh, that's just stupid. Uh, and fourth, something that has nothing to do with him. Right? This is really interesting. And the Qayyim, by the way, mentions this. Sometimes, guys, girls too, yeah, this guys, you are controlling without realizing. Like, you go to your spouse, you're like, I don't like the shoes. It's not your business, it's not your shoes, it's shoes. Let her wear whatever she wants. Now, if she's wearing something that you think is horrible, it's a different discussion. But as far as shoes, you don't care. It's not, it's not your job. Oh, I don't want you to buy this brand and buy this brand. What is it going to do for you? You don't have to listen when he does that. Because it has nothing to do with him. Now he can tell you, listen, I want you to put a hijab on. You know, like, but wait a minute, you married me without a hijab, now you're asking me. You have to listen. Why? Because he's your husband. And he's telling you something that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obligated to you. Now, the discussion here comes, which can be really tricky. If you married somebody who's not a hijab, so you're marrying her with accepting the fact that she's not hijab. 
this is when it comes really tricky. Because she can come and say, well, you, you married me as an as one idea. Now, what happened? Now, for you, for the sisters, a lot of times the brothers were going to get married and they're like, oh, I'll convince her, da 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 da. Give them thoughts. And I know it's not an easy decision yet. I'm not, not going to act like it's easy just for a hijab or take off. But maybe he genuinely cares about you. And he genuinely really wants you to have a hijab on. And he just cares, like genuinely cares. And he's trying to help you with it. But right? just put it on, I'll, I'll encourage you. Right? I'll buy you no hijabs. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so, when, when it comes to roles and responsibility, that's the foundation. You provide for her, and she listens to you. How you do that is going to depend on both of you. So for example, you might be a guy who likes to go to your mom every Thursday night. Right? So you're going to take your wife with you. And a lot of these things you talk about beforehand, but go with me. And you are going to go to your family on Friday night. You go with her. Because it's part of her emotional well-being is to see her parents too. So you go with her, you have to provide that. So you provide, and she obeys. How is going to depend on all of you. It's going to depend on how you define that, you know, how you want to be provided for, and how you want to be obeyed. Again, as long as you stay away from these four things that I mentioned. Does this make sense? Can you follow up on this? Thank you. And the third question that we have is, is financial independence or having a job necessary before marriage? Absolutely. Is that love? <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question that we have is, how should I get to know someone in a hallway? Okay. Talking to somebody with the purpose of trying to get married is not haram. What's haram is what you're talking about. At the high level, talking to somebody to get to know them is not haram. With the objective of marriage, you are getting to know them because you're bored. Again, let me phrase this one more time. Getting to know somebody with the objective of trying to get married is not haram. How you do it and what to talk about is going to determine if you're doing something haram or not. General guidelines is that there's a lot of conversations to stay away from. Like intimate conversations, you stay away from that. A lot of the emotional lovey-dovey stuff, you stay away from that. And it's not good for you, by the way, in the very early stages. Right? Don't fall in love too quick. Right? Tame yourself for a little bit of time. So you are able to objectively assess that person in front of you. Right? Uh, talking about something haram, like, like somebody else. You shouldn't be meeting with your you know, potential candidate and backbite about somebody else or lie about somebody else. Or blah, blah, blah. You shouldn't do that. Because again, it goes for any conversation. You shouldn't be alone. Physically alone in one place and nobody's around. What is what is acceptable is that when you're in public places. So you go to a restaurant and she's you know you're talking to each other and you get to one another. Again, I want you guys, I want you to understand this is the objective. If you realize that she's not the right person for you, stop talking. Allah, that's it. She's not the right person for you now. Why are you talking? Or if he's not the right person for you, okay, I'm not interested anymore, we'll find someone else. You end it. But as long as you're trying to get to know one another, again, objectively, you know, without being in private, obviously you're not allowed to touch each other, you're not allowed to share anything inappropriate, whether phrases or, you know, like you stay away from like a lot of the big compliments, right? You stay away from a lot of these because these are just doors. And it's just not the time for it. I promise you. I promise you. If you do this right in the beginning, and you both are compatible, you have plenty of time to compliment each other. And tell her how beautiful your hijab looks like. 
and you tell them how beautiful his shoes look like, or whatever you might buy. Right? You'll have plenty of time to do that. But in the beginning, you get to know one another in a halal way, just don't talk about it in Haram. Right? Now, of the ways is that, and again, it really depends of, on, and again, on you and her and whatnot, but don't make it too long. There's enough stuff you need to learn about them. If they're the right person, you feel like they're the right person, get engaged. Now, one thing. What is the purpose of engagement, by the way? Does anyone know? What's the purpose of engagement? Because engagement is part of the deen. It's mentioned in the Quran, it's mentioned in some of the Prophets of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the purpose of the engagement? Yes. MashaAllah. Allah bless you. The Prophet he says, لا يخطب أحدكم على خطبة أخي. None of you, he's talking to the guys, none of you should propose on top of the proposal of his brother. Basically, he's saying that the reason you get engaged is that she's taken. And you operate like you get to know this person for the sake of marrying them. As soon as you realize that she, she's the right person or she's the right person, you get married. Obviously when everything is checked, like you're ready, financial, all that stuff. But the idea is that the engagement is a step for you to get married to, and early on you get to know one another, but just simply get to know one another, like anybody else. And you stay away from just the useless conversation. It doesn't really matter what type of movies you like. It's not important. Whether he likes horror movies or he likes Something else. It doesn't really matter. It's okay. You can watch movies on your own after. You know. But like, get to know the things that are important early on. And a lot of people will say, you know, if you're like FaceTime or whatever, like be in a public place, even during the engagement time. Like your mom should know that you're trying to get to know her, and your mom should know your dad should know that you're trying to get him, and you talk in public. Right? Like in the living room, for example, your mom is kind of walking around doing her own thing, or your dad, your other siblings, and you're like, no, it's kind of weird, I want to be private. Yeah, you want to be private for a reason. You check that reason. Right? Is it just because you feel awkward? Is it because you want to get into conversations that you, you don't want your mom to, to, to listen to? You still can have some privacy. That's okay, like in a corner, in a home, whatever. But even when you're chatting with each other, you should be in public, even at your own home, because. You are not going to need a room for shaitan. Because you can really easily slip and you start talking about things that are just a little bit too early. Hope that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and I know there are a lot of questions in the Q&A forum, but just to be aware of time, this will be our last question. Are there any resources that we can use to learn more about marriage? Um, So there's a couple of things. I think there's a class, there's an online class with the Nakhab Institute. I think we should believe. Uh, you can just Google it. Uh, just Google the Nakhab Institute.com or .org or something like that. You may find an online program. It's like a module that you go through. There's also uh, a sister in Dallas. Her name is Sister Hala Benani. Hala Benani. I can tell the brothers maybe to send it out to the Whatever. But Sister Hala Benani has a program called Five Pillars of Marriage. It's an online program. Uh, I personally was in that program with my wife before we got married. And it's, she's an incredible psychologist who also has an Islamic studies background. And she goes through a really nice kind of step by step process of preparing you for marriage. Uh, so that, that's something I, I highly recommend as well. Um, Should yes and the jazz. There's a lot of these programs and these missions. Uh, obviously, you can never go to Dallas. Uh, he lives in Dallas, but he has a lot of like a lot of these are live stream. So you may be able to find some lectures online like on YouTube and stuff like that. He has a lot of things. Uh, and then obviously tap into Chaplain Kaiser. He's always busy, but maybe see this guy as well. He's counseling. And um, he's been doing it for a few years, so maybe you can ask him for some advice. Uh, if uh, you know, he has any specific advice for you on how to get to know my marriage. Uh, I'm almost asking. Is 
Muzad Allah on behalf of MSA and everyone here, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and speaking to us about this super, super important topic. So, Muzad Allah. Are there any SPAC announcements that need to be made? Hey guys, for those that did not get their questions answered, I'm going to stay around in Shama. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and eat it so I can. But I'll stay around in the